is another episode of the Fuzzy Mike. This is the Fuzzy Mike. The interview series without format, without boundaries, without focus. Fuzzy, pretty much based on this goofy looking microphone here. Bit of a horse's tail. This <laughs> is the Fuzzy Mike. My interests are, they're vastly Fuzzy enormous. Mike. Damon Bradshaw, Damon Bradshaw is the driver Fuzzy of the Mike. Monster Energy Monster Truck. I love NASA, I love death metal. Uh, Lindsey Wink, you are a fan favorite. I don't get to talk about that on the radio, and so this is like my little outlet. When I get to talk to, you know, artists that I really look up to and I admire, and I don't think you've ever written a bad song. No. This just makes it totally well, me, worthwhile for me. What's your email? <laughs> the fuzzy mic. There we go. Now, the thing about the fuzzy mic when I created it a few years ago was uh, you, you don't really know what you're going to be hearing about with the particular interviews. I mean, heck, just earlier this week, we posted a, uh, a conversation that I had with author Abby Ross in her book, The Poop Diaries. This episode's a, a little heavier in topic because it deals with COVID-19. And COVID-19 has us obviously concerned about our health, and we're seeing the way that it is affecting the global economy. But one way that we may not be thinking about COVID-19, and that is something that jurisdictions throughout the country are wrestling with, debating what to do with persons accused of crimes who are incarcerated during this precarious time. COVID-19, it needs people to spread its, uh, spread its virus and spread itself. And where are people existing and not being able to go anywhere well that's the jails and the prisons and so i thought you know what let's go to a guy who's very versed in this his name is ken good ken is a board member of the professional bondsman of texas he is also a texas bail attorney and he's going to tell us uh, what this uh, what this sticky situation is all about and he's also going to tell us what can be done about it ken welcome to the program how are you I'm doing well. And yourself, sir? I'm doing quite well as well. Uh, great to talk to you. Thank you for calling in. Uh, a lot of different things to discuss with you. And first, I just want to jump right in with a preliminary question. What is bail? What is bond? Uh, bail is something that's been around for over 200 years. It is a something given uh, to secure a promise uh, that you will return to court any time that a court requires you to appear in exchange for your release for your liberty uh, while a criminal case is pending. Is bail always set at a dollar amount? In Texas, yes. Statute, the statute uh, 1715 of the Texas Code of Criminal Procedure requires that bail be set at a dollar amount, and that is the job of the trial court. Uh, based on several factors, it has to be high enough to ensure that you will uh, reappear, taking into consideration four or five factors. Okay, so it, back up there a minute. You said it, make sure that it's high enough that you will appear. What about these PR $30 bonds, what they call what, personal recognizance? Well, that's a different situation. That's something that has not been around very long. You know, our Texas Constitution says everyone except for a certain number of crimes has a right to be released from jail on bail with sufficient sureties. Under Texas law, a PR bond is a bond without surety. So it is just a personal promise uh, on paper. If it's a $30 bond, then that's the, that's the effect of the judge recognizes it has to be a dollar amount, but they prefer it to be no dollar amount and just be a bare promise. So what kind of criminal activity would fall under a PR, a personal recognizance? Well, the problem we're having is across the country, uh, you know, while it was meant originally to help poor people uh, when they had no other alternative for getting out of jail, it's being expanded for use for, you know, more and more. Uh, California is a good example. They downgrade a whole list of crimes from felonies to misdemeanors and then started saying, well, you know, felony crime is down. Uh, in, da in, in Harris County, the district court judges just issued an order in the last two days. Uh, allowing for PR bonds for uh, just giving them automatically for a, a list of felony uh, charges now uh, because of the coronavirus. So uh, it was intended to be very limited use, and it's it's, it's expanding. And the problem with that is um, the failure to peer rate is so much higher on those. You have you know Harris County have at least a fifty or more chance that they won't show up for court, and that's just creating huge backlogs of cases. And at a certain point in time, your, your, your criminal justice system either shuts down or they have to discount 
uh, crimes or punishments to get people to show up to get the cases through the system because otherwise they just have to try every case and and nothing you know the backlog keeps growing so they have to discount punishment to get people an incentive to take it and as a result uh, the criminal justice system just gets you know finally shuts down and that's what we're seeing but even before the crisis in Harris County, now it would just be much worse. Okay, Ken, well, now it is. Uh, Attorney Ken Good, uh, we're talking about this right now. But, uh, discount could have two different meanings here. Discount as in they chop off, uh, they give a discount on some price or something, or discount like totally discredit, which what are we talking about? We're, we're discounting the, what the pun- normal punishment is. Like uh, there's been an article written uh, by, um, you know, uh, Mr. Gamaldi, who is, uh, you know, the president of the uh, – Police, uh, police union. Association. Yes, and he he has highlighted how the uh, district attorney's office is giving out deferred adjudication, which means if you're successful, then it, it isn't even on your record. They're giving that out like candy right now to even uh, serious crimes to pro- to try to prevent uh, the backlogs from getting even worse and to, to stop or hopefully stop the system from shutting down. So they're giving out – you know, these things which are deep discounts on what your punishment would be uh, at like candy. Are we doing this because of prison overcrowding or are we doing this because people are just better attorneys now and better litigators? So I, I think there's a coalition on the other side. I think part of the coalition is uh, like Justice, uh, Chief Justice Hecht on the Supreme Court of Texas. He says we have jail overcrowding and that's the reason why we need to do this. But we have a large group of uh, that's also part of the coalition that just doesn't – that thinks that this criminal justice system is not fair. I, I think they incorrectly see the issue as a, a racial issue that we're mistreating uh, certain races. I see it as a, uh inner city uh, crime problem, uh, in our, and, and the problem is all the, there's been inner city flight, and so only certain minorities are, are left there. But, you know, the schools have failed, uh, uh, families have failed, uh, there's no opportunity for work, we have a tremendous drug overdose problem, and as a result, uh, there, we have a huge inner city crime problem, and where we are having these issues is in the inner city, that's where we're seeing it as a, as a large problem. And so I, I think that the co- that coalition is made up of some people who think there's jail overcrowding, but a lot of people who, uh, another big coalition that thinks that we're just mistreating certain minorities, and they shouldn't have to be. Uh, uh, they shouldn't be charged with crimes if they're poor. And I think that's wrong. As a society, we can't function if that's what we're doing. Where this is leading is because of COVID nineteen. We are now seeing across the country, even here in Texas, but even as far up as the, as the Northeast, New Jersey, um, what they're calling low-level criminals are being released to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Describe and explain what a uh, low-level criminal is. Well, they may be calling it low-level, but you have they're not arresting low-level, and they're releasing people uh, uh they're releasing as many people as they can. In fact, right now, if you just go into the jail under arrest and start coughing, you're going to get – they're not going to take you. Uh, there was a, uh, someone who was arrested on capital murder that went before a judge in Harris County in the last week, and he said he was scared of getting COVID-19, and they gave him a PR bond. So they can call it – they're calling it low level, but this is not low level. They're, this is uh, – it's like you know the county fair for local criminals. Low-level people are not being arrested, and they're releasing almost everybody from the jail they can. And they're releasing people post-conviction who are serving time in the county jail. And there's been at least one report of someone they released had nowhere to go. I mean, do you think these types of people are going, you know, going to just sit back and say, "Well, we're going to wait for this COVID virus to get over with"? No, this is like. This is Christmas to them. They can go out and commit as many crimes as they want, and they won't even get arrested. We won't even hear about it. We'll hear about the people who had their cars broke into. The only ones we're going to hear about is like the case in Utah where somebody was released because of COVID-19, and he was rearrested at gunpoint because he had broken into a lady's house and was holding her at, at knife point, and her son figured it out and called the police. Sounds like a pretty violent That's offense. Not- 
It's very violent, and that's the only reason why we're hearing about it. The people who are just breaking into cars, the people that are just going into these offices that are has nobody there and picking up and choosing whatever they want, the police aren't even responding to those calls. You're going to hear about those when we start coming back uh, and when, when businesses start to reopen. Well, what you're talking about, uh, Bayer County, Texas Sheriff Javier Salazar, uh, because of COVID-19 mitigation plan, he says uh, uh, filing nonviolent offenses at large, he would rather that not be not be done. That's right. That's right. That's, we're hearing that everywhere. And that's that's not the solution. Making the, a, a chaotic situation worse is not the solution. I mean, they should be setting up uh, – procedures in their jail to, I mean, like in the federal system right now, if you're arrested, you're adding a day to processing because the first day you're going to be checked out medically. Uh, We've had our first death in Texas. The person was 90 something years old. I mean, this is like the the jails have a procedures for the flu being in the jail. We should be enacting these types of procedures. I mean, we should be following those procedures. And then if somebody, uh, identifies or gets uh, the COVID-19, we should be checking them for respiratory issues and making the decision on that basis on whether to release them. What do you say about this, okay? They they say that the reason that they want to uh, kind of release low-level prisoners is what they called it, but you already said that that's kind of a misnomer, misconception, is because if the staff were to come down with COVID-19, then what happens in the jail? I agree. I agree with that. We this is a, a very difficult situation, but they already have procedures in place for addressing the flu, and this is this is maybe. I mean, right now I would say if you get this, you got the a, maybe a bad case of flu unless you have respiratory issues. That's what the statistics and the studies are showing. Let's act not out of fear. Let's act with reason and basis for the for jails. I've been telling people you should have different staffs taking care of uh, people who've been identified uh, with the COVID virus and, and segregating them so that to address that very issue. But they already have procedures for that when, when they have the flu in the jail. Why is this any different? Why are we acting irrationally and out of fear here when uh, it's, this is really just a bad case of flu? And it's going, it is not going to. It is absolutely hurting public safety, and the police are turning a blind eye to that. They're being told to turn a blind eye or they're choosing to? They're being told to by the sheriff's. Well, the sheriff's officer is saying, well, no, no, no. I think this, it depends on where you are because we've got police that are trying to make arrests, but the courts aren't taking anybody or they're turning them away or the DA's offices aren't following them. Like, I mean, right now you can, tell, you can tell that the police departments in Harris County are absolutely livid, but you know the DA's office won't take a case because they, uh, they have instant filing. So if you – uh, arrest somebody, they'll decide right then whether to file a case. Right now, they're not doing it. They want, and some places have suspended the issues of warrants or the. Uh, what that means is, you know, if, if you get stopped for speeding, they check you to see if there's any outstanding warrants. Well, suspending that means that if you get stopped and they check you for a warrant and see that there is one, they're not going to take you in. So, our, you know, normally when you have somebody on a PR bond and they fail to show up for court. The way they get back into the system is by creating another crime. Well, we've even set that system aside. So if someone's stopped and identified by the police and they have an outstanding warrant, they don't take them. So if you, if, so our career low-level criminals are, are having Christmas every day because the police won't stop them, they won't arrest them, they won't do anything. What do you think the population, because it's estimated that in America, in federal, state, and local jails, we have 2.3 million incarcerated. What is the percentage of violent offenders and then low level? Do you know? I don't know. Uh, well, well no, that's not true. I do I do have some idea of it, like for county jails. Uh, and for, for the uh, state system, I'd say it's probably, uh, it's all felonies because we don't, we've pushed all the stuff below felony or even uh uh, some felony offenses, we push them back to the county. On the county jail, you know, the county jails have to report their statistics uh, every month to the state. And so, you know, we've looked at some of those, uh, like uh, Harris County uh, a year ago on a, a snapshot for a month. The number of people who are in the jail at any given time is like 9% for misdemeanors. And what that means is th- that number is made up of the people who are being arrested and released, arrested and released, and, or, and the ones that are being arrested and then can't get out of jail.
because of their history or whatever, nobody wants to bond them out, or their bond is so high because of their uh, they failed to appear. Uh, that was before reform. That there was about nine percent. So you've got, uh, and then the rest is either uh, felonies, state jail felonies, or you know we've got blue warrant holes, which means they're in jail uh, because they were released from the uh, state system on uh, parole and they have a parole violation, or they're they're on a probation violation too, which you know uh, you can't just release somebody that there's on a probation violation. So you might have somebody on this there, but they're there on a probation violation. So. They can't be released till they see the judge. So and we're talking before this crisis. A very small percentage of the jail uh, was already misdemeanors, uh, and you know, in the litigation, it was probably identified as three percent or less. What is the percentage of criminals that get released and then end up back in? Is that called, what they call it recidivism? Yes. What's yeah? What's their recidivism rate? Yeah, it's going up in Harris County, especially. Uh, and the reason why it's going up is because you have all these. Uh, we're, we're removing accountability from the system. Um, so normally, you know, like our whole criminal justice system is based upon accountability. So first-time offenders get a less offense uh, than uh, return people who committed several offenses before that. We're now taking that to the pretrial system set level. So in Harris County, if you get a PR bond and fail to show up, which right now it's at least 50 percent, well, right now it's 100 percent because they're not even having in court. I mean, but if you had court, nobody would come. So, But if it was 50 percent, then you, when you do come back, you get another PR bond, and then you miss, and then when you come back, you get another PR bond. They're not filing. You can, you know, you can file new charges when they fail to appear for failing to appear, but we don't do that. And so we've taken out all accountability, and, and as a result, that is leading to higher recidiv- recidivism because uh, the message we're sending, you know, these low-level career criminals is you're not going to be punished. You're not going to have anything happen to you. That's the reason why in New York you have this guy that's been arrested 140-something times, 130-something times when they were reporting it. Now it's worse. And we had officers saying, all I'm doing is arresting the same people every day because you release them. They commit a new crime, and I go, well, now we're taking out that step. They're committing crimes every day, and nobody's arresting them. They won't even respond to a call. You're on your own. That's why you're seeing, you know, gun gun sales rise. Um, you know, in Chicago or in Illinois, no, in L.A., the sheriff tried to close down gun shops during the COVID virus, and that was reported. What wasn't reported is the county attorney came back and said, you cannot do that. And so the sheriff came back and said he, he, he changed his, his order and, and and I think the basis for that is other than you have a constitutional right, but if the, if the government can't protect you during these times, goodness gracious, at least give the citizens the, the ability to protect themselves during this time. So with prisoners being released, and it doesn't necessarily, as you've pointed out, mean low-level criminals, it, it could be felons being released because of COVID-19 fears inside of our prisons. How at risk are we as citizens? Well, right now we're staying at home. So if you're staying at home, you're at risk for um, a you know, home break-in, which I think is a very confrontational, and it would take a certain sort. And I think that is low. But what we're seeing is all these businesses that uh, uh, don't have anybody there or are very low staff. You're you're seeing a lot of that. You're going to see. You're, you're we're seeing, I'm sure, break-ins for cars. Uh, the, uh, we've, there's already been reports to truck drivers that they should avoid. Uh, rest stops because uh, gangs are waiting for them uh, to, uh, you know, get their load. And so I, I think that it, it's um, – they're, they're going to identify where the, the uh, points of access are. Uh, but the low-level crimes, I think right now you're looking at uh, break-ins for your cars and businesses that are empty. And as it, as it goes longer, which, I mean, it can't go too much longer – uh, then people are going to get more and more desperate. So, okay, no. I think you're at a you know you're at a you're at above average risk. It is a, it's a sticky situation though because I want to take you inside the prison now. Okay, you've got two. Uh, what I've understood anyway, I've never been in prison or I've never even visited inside of one. Um, but I understand that you have two prisoners to a cell. Uh, everything is completely overcrowded, so it's impossible to keep that six feet distance between people. It, as a, as a, a species that practices humanitarianism, how humane is that? Well, I mean, let's first let's you know we, let's make sure our terms are right. We're saying prison, and then we have county jails. Okay, so prison there, there is, it's is different. A term of art. 
yeah, for you know post conviction only, and it's the state facility. We're talking mostly about the county facilities, so we're talking about county jails. They are releasing some people who are post conviction, who are been convicted of a crime, and they can be in the county jail either waiting to go to the federal system on a felony, or they're serving their time in the county even for a state jail felony. So these, so they're releasing. They're not arresting new people for unless they uh, under very limited circumstances. They're uh, they're re- they're releasing everybody they can. They're not, and they're not bringing new people in. And they're identifying uh, who can we release, even the ones who are serving time, releasing them, and we would call it releasing them early. There is a humanitarian element to it. I don't dispute that, but I think we're acting out of fear right now. We should be following our flu. Uh, Standards for the jail, which the, every jail in the state, the county jails have a, a protocol for following when the, there's a flu breakout. You should have a section of the jail that's quarantined. You have a section that where you're assessing people, waiting for their results, and you have the general population. And you may have to have different people treating. But this is my point. Isn't this an example of where government has once again failed? I mean, the government can't even run the jail during a crisis. They can't take care of the public during a crisis. How are I mean, they're in the process of trying to reform the bail system. Harris County is the best example. It's completely failed. Um, uh, Joe Gamaldi just did an article in the last week or so talking about uh, jail, st- I mean, crime statistics before the virus. And, I mean, c- crime statistics are going way up as a result of just bail reform before the virus. I mean, kidnappings in Harris County up 68% year over. Uh, I mean, jail- bail reform can't continue because the system will fail, and now we're in the virus where people are acting irrationally uh, and out of fear, and the system has shut down. The problem is how big is is the problem going to be when we finally come back to work? It's going to be astronomical. What can we do? Well, right now we we have to hunker down because we have to. You know, we're uh, us citizens. We're law-abiding people. And we're going to follow the directions of our government. And this is what our government is saying to do. They're wrong. So when this ends, we have to either replace these people or we have to make sure that in the, you know, I'm a big person about, don't tell me what all I'm doing wrong. We were in the middle of a crisis. Let's look for solutions. But after the crisis, let's go back and figure out what we did right and what we did wrong so that the next time we don't repeat the same mistakes. We're repeating huge a lot of mistakes of history right now. We're giving everybody PR bonds when we know that anyone who gets one will not – they have a, at least a 50 percent failure to peer rate. It would be better – and this isn't even authorized by, by law. It would be better for just to release them and say, come back with a surety bond in three days. Uh, go out and find one, and this is what it is, and I'm just releasing you. Come back and bring it in three days, and you're done. And the reason why that would be better – they have a 400% better chance of coming to court on a surety bond. None of these people are going to come back to court. They're going to have to be arrested on a new crime, and then in Harris County, they'll get a new PR bond. Everywhere else in the state, they'll have higher bonds set, and it'll be, and then they'll have to deal with a higher bond plus the new bond on the, on the new charge. And a surety bond is one that's, that's put up with cash or some sort of collateral? Yes, uh, sh- no, not. I mean, a surety bond is either cash or a private industry bond. I mean, they pay a very small payment. You know, on a thousand dollar bond, they may pay a hundred dollars as premium to the to to a bondsman who posts the bond, and then then we're responsible for giving them court notices. We're responsible for making them for supervising them. We're responsible for making sure they get to court, and if they don't go, we're responsible for going to get them and bringing them back. So their case can be put back on track as soon as possible. So that and, and when you do, that's the point where we call in Dog the Bounty Hunter, right? Well, if it's a large bond and there's a failure to appear, at you know in Texas we have a certain amount of time where we can get them back and we can mitigate that loss. Uh, we can bring we would bring in uh, someone like Dog the Bounty Hunter. I don't know if he's licensed in Texas, but you have to, you know, I'm bond, just using bounty, him as an example. Bondsman, yeah, but a bondsman can't go out and get their own uh, defendants back. You have to have a license. You have to be a licensed private investigator. Under uh, And so I think uh, we call them recovery age. Bounty Hunters is good. Is just as good. But you have to be licensed. Uh, 
as a private investigator to be able to go and pick someone up and take them to the jail. So something else that I read in regards to uh, releasing prisoners because of fears of COVID-19 inside the jail system themselves uh, is that the, what the and maybe I misinterpreted this. Ken, good. You can tell me if I did or not. But I, I read, I think that if you're like in a 10 year sentence and you're five years in, they're going to release you and then they expect you as the detainee to report back once the prisons are open. Did I get? Did I read well, that right? Yes, I believe that is happening now. I think the majority is they're they're actually bringing them in and shortening their sentence and letting them out early. What's really concerned me is on reports like that. You know, the fear is so irrational. They should be doing an in individual cases. Do you have somewhere to go? Do you have somewhere to stay? There was one report where they released somebody, and after they released him, he had some, nowhere to go. I mean, how irrational is that? Do you think that person's not going to be a problem child? I mean, he was a problem child first. He was in jail. He's been in prison. He's been released. He, he's glad to get out, but he has nowhere to go. What other option does he have but to go create havoc? Getting back to the humanitarian issue, what do you say to people who say, well, they deserve to be in there because they've committed an offense. To what degree? It doesn't matter. They got caught and they, they, they belong in there. So why not just keep uh, uh, offenders inside the walls of a jail and it'll just stay in uh, the COVID-19 will just stay in there and it wouldn't be released upon the public. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I think that's an overstatement and I don't, of course I disagree with that. I think we should, uh, we shouldn't be acting illogically in either extreme. You know, what we should be protecting people in the jail from is getting lost in the system and not being tracked. And, you know, we have, already laws in place now which are not being followed. We had an example of a, a lady in Bear County who was arrested. She had mental issues. She had a $300 bond set, but she wouldn't go to court. She refused to be interviewed. And she went to the infirmary, and three months later she died. Well, existing law, which was not followed, said she was there on a misdemeanor after 30 days. She should have been released on a PR bond. That didn't happen. So we should be tracking and following people in jail because we don't want people in jail longer than whatever sentence they could have gotten. But that's the problem is we, our jails are not have the capability of doing that now in a lot of situations, or they're not set up to do that. But I think we, I mean, what's more humane, in my opinion, is following our normal flu procedures that we have in the jail. I mean, we're not releasing people every winter because of the flu. Even when we have a bad case of flu and we're shutting down schools, do you think flu is not in the jail? It's in the jail just like it's in the population. And just like when there's a flu epidemic, it spreads in the schools, it spreads in the jails too. We're not taking extreme procedures during those years to do what we're doing now. We should be following our normal flu procedures for the county jails. And then when someone comes down with it, we should be evaluating them on a uh, one-on-one basis to decide if we need to change what our normal procedures are for them. One might argue, though, Ken, that there is no vaccine for COVID-19. There is no, an antibiotic wouldn't work because it's a virus, it's not a bacteria. So are we essentially, by keeping incarcerated people in close proximity with no known cure, are we sealing their fate? No, no, because, you know, I mean, there's no cure for the flu when the flu vaccine doesn't cover it. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the flu vaccine only covers certain flus, and sometimes it doesn't cover the ones that's being spread that year. Uh, the COVID-19 is a virus, and, you know, the very first article I read about it said it's a pneumonia virus. And so if you think of it as a pneumonia virus, it's a virus that attacks your respiratory system, and if you are respiratory compromised or if you're older and you have, uh, you, you're exposed there, the, the problem is going to be if the, if people have the complications is they're going to need comfort care, which is what these ventilators are, until their lungs can get through uh, the viral process. That is handled through the normal procedures at the jail. I mean, if someone came down with a, a bad case of flu and got and looked like they were needing a, a hospital care, they would just release them on a PR bond. They'd go to the judge and say, hey, this person needs care. We don't want the county to pay for it. And so we want uh, we want to release them on a PR bond. Same thing if someone showed up in the jail and got preg- and was pregnant. If they were getting ready for delivery, they would release them on a PR bond because they wouldn't, wouldn't want the county to pay for the delivery. 
Those are the procedures that should be followed. That's much more humane than what we're currently doing because right now we're sacrificing all public safety uh, out of fear. I mean, we shouldn't act out of fear. Ken, where can we go to read more about this? You can go to our uh, uh, website, pbtx.com, uh, and you can go to the blog. We're posting uh, news uh, articles uh, every day on that uh, so that people can stay up to date. Uh, hopefully this will end very quickly and, and we can start acting out of reason and uh, and making decisions not based on fear. Ken, I appreciate your time and thank you so much for joining us. I've actually been enlightened. Uh, the, I, I have, You know firsthand that I had some misinformation and you clarified it for me. I learned a few things about bail. I learned a few things about bonds and I also learned the difference between uh, prison and jail. So thank you for, uh, for giving me that. Hopefully I've presented a few questions to give both sides uh, a, a viewpoint on this sticky, sticky situation. So thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I, I thought it was great, and I thought you asked tough questions, and I enjoyed it very much. That's Ken Good. He's a Texas bail attorney and board member of the Professional Bondsman of Texas. My thanks to Kara Downs from Media Vista Public Relations for getting me in touch with Ken and for uh, bringing this uh, issue to my attention. The executive producer of The Fuzzy Mike is Trish Klein, social media director Lisa Tynan, production Zach Sheesh at theradiofarm.com. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, also Instagram, Twitter, and you can listen to this on SoundCloud. Also tune in Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and right here on thefuzzymike.com. My name is Kevin Klein. I'm your host. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Fuzzy Mike. The Fuzzy Mike. Thanks for listening to The Fuzzy Mike. Check back often and stay fuzzy. Wait a second. Did we read that right? Stay fuzzy?